Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for the second half of our equine gross pathology exam. The first half of this test is gross path challenge number 74. Sorry, they got a little out of order this week. And so this one is gonna be gross path challenge number 76. Are you ready to begin? Fantastic. First question today, tissue from a horse, what is the most likely cause of this lesion? Is it equine pegivirus, equine flavivirus, equine parvovirus, or equine papacivirus? Okay, time's up. This is a classic disease, which has been around for more than 100 years. First identified by Dr. Arnold Tyler, Sir Arnold Tyler, in South Africa. And for many years, up to this day, it bears his name as Tyler's disease. It is massive necrosis of the liver of a horse. Generally, it has been associated in most cases with administration of some sort of xenobiotic, often antitoxins or other medicants in horses. But the interesting thing about this disease is that horses that are stabled next to them who have not had any of these drugs may come down with it as well. It causes fulminant uh, hepatic disease, hepatoencephalopathy, clinical signs of neurologic depression, head pressing, uh, furor, uh, et cetera. And the classic lesion is that of a, known as a dish rag liver. All of the hepatocytes are dead. It's what we call massive necrosis. Not that there's tremendous amount of necrosis, but that there is necrosis in all parts of the lobular, the central lobular, mid-zonal, and periporal layers. That's when we use the term massive necrosis. This is a, a disease that uh, even as far back as when I was taking it, there was always controversy. Um, and I think we are finally getting close to the actual truth of this. Um, all of the four viruses have been implicated in causing Tyler's disease within the last five or six years. Uh, about five years ago, an equine flavivirus was isolated from liver and blood of an affected animal. And that was very popular for a while, um, but it turned out not to be the case. Within the last several years, um, Peggy viruses and Apassi viruses and parvovirus have been isolated from animals with the disease. And now people are going back to look at stocks of, of uh, pooled mare serum and uh, an antitoxin. And it turns out that the one that appears to be the most prevalent and seen in uh, most of this is equine parvovirus. So that would be the correct answer for this particular question today. Uh, the equine peggy virus does not appear to be hepatotropic, um, early isolated from some of these cases, but does not appear to be uh, uh, hepatotropic because hepatic disease. Hepasi virus comes from the term hepatitis C virus, certainly hepatotropic uh, in affected horses, but has not been repeatedly isolated to the extent that the equine parvovirus has. Um, every five years, it seems I come up with a new virus as the answer to this question, but at the current moment, thinking is uh, equine parvovirus and a viral condition would explain why some animals who are stable next to the animals that receive these uh, antitoxins or other xenobiotics would get this condition. Our next question, also from a horse, which of the following hormones is used as a clinical indicator of the presence of this tumor? Well, I gave you a little bit of a hint on what you're looking at. Okay. Uh, time's up on this one. We are looking down into the hypothalamus. We're looking into the skull of this horse, and we are looking at the pituitary, which is rather large. It probably is pressing on the bottom of the brain or the hypothalamus. So this animal probably has a couple of things going on. 
One is pituitary pars intermedia disease, where you have pressure upwards on the hypothalamus, which in these horses will cause derangement of some sickly processes like shedding of hair, sweating. Um, it may cause uh, diabetes insipidus. Uh, it may affect eating and drinking. So these animals might get a little fat and they might be polydipsic. Okay, um, but we're talking about hormones here. So we're probably talking about the other disease associated with it, the, the Cushing's-like syndrome that we see in this horse. PPID is not hormonal, it's due to pressure, but you also have a cortisol-like, or a Cushing's-like syndrome uh, in these animals. So the question is, which of the following hormones is used as a clinical indicator of the presence of this tumor? So which one will you be able to identify and say this horse has this tumor? This particular uh, question comes straight out of Jeb and Kennedy, even though it's a clinical question. Volume 3, page 283 to 285. Um, and the correct answer here is alpha MSH. These are very high. Now, all of these hormones are produced in excess. They're just not used as testable. The animals will have excess ACTH, which causes them to produce uh, too much cortisol. Um, they also will have uh, high glucose levels in their blood, which may go along with a third part of the triad in many of these affected horses, which is metabolic syndrome which involves insulin resistance. Okay, beta endorphin certainly is uh, a, one of the hormones that is derived from uh, corticolite intermediate peptides. It is cleaved into beta endorphin as one of the end products. Beta endorphin is an endorphin. It makes these horses feel good. They also can make them feel a little sleepy or somnolent, and some of these uh, animals are described as somnolent, so it's that endorphin. And then corticotropin-like intermediate peptide usually breaks down into a number of other peptides. So alpha MSH is the clinical indicator of the presence of this tumor. Okay, slide number three in this test is also tissue from a horse. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is this rabdidid migration, strongyl migration, fluke migration, or ascarid migration? Okay, time's up. We are looking at the flank of the animal, the abdominal wall, and you can see these large hematomas, which are formed by the migration of Strongylus aquinas. So um, the correct answer is B, strongyl migration. All the rest of these uh, nematodes do migrate within the tissue of horses. Uh, it's an interesting question. I like this one. It forces you to know a little bit about some of the, these parasites. Um, there's a fantastic book that's available through the Davis Thompson Foundation, which uh, written by Dr. Chris Gardner. Uh, the name of the book is uh, Metazoans in Tissue, Annapolis of Metazoans in Tissue Section. Uh, it costs about 40 bucks. It's a beautifully illustrated book, and it has a really nice breakdown of how to tell the different types of nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes apart. Um, if we look at a rabdidid migration, well, the rabdidid that affects horses, is Halicephalobus gingivalis. One where you only find the females and the larvae and the worms, the males generally tend to stay home in the decaying plant material that these horses get into. So it's not rabidated. Fluke migration. You do have flukes in horses. They're not very common, but you can see fluke migration in horses. And ascarid migration will sure Parascarid sequorum is an ascarid of primarily young horses, which goes through a very traditional uh, pulmonary and hepatic migration 
And so some of the severely affected foals can have sort of an eosinophilic pneumonia as the stage three larva migrate through the tissues on their way to end up in the duodenum where they will become adults and the life cycle will continue. Slide number four is a horse, believe it or not. The question is, in horses with the condition above, which of the following is true? A, changes in P3 are most often present late in development of this condition. B, sclerotic changes are seen in the dorsal cortex of P3. C, sclerotic changes are seen in the solar cortex of P3. And four, medullary inflammation is seen in P3. Okay, this is one that is uh, out of a article that was written in 2015 in Veterinary Pathology by Dr. Julie Ingalls from New Bolton Center, which is known as Osteopathology in the Equine Distal Phalanx Associated with the Development and Progression of Laminitis. Now, we look at the picture here. This is a great case of chronic laminitis. The reason we know that it's chronic is we have downward rotation of P3. Normally, this should be parallel to the dorsal hoof wall, so it should be going like this. Now, what happens when you have laminitis? You have a loosening of the dermal papilla and the sensitive lamina. This becomes loose, and the constant upward pressure of the deep digital flexor tendon causes the bone to go backwards, this to drop down, and we have a P3, which is looks like um, at one point was about ready to go through the sole. This sole looks like it has been trimmed, um, unfortunately. This is a chronic condition. The reason that you know that it's chronic is there's not a lot of hemorrhage, um, active hemorrhage going on here, the dorsal area. And I want you to look at what has filled in right here. This whitish material is filled in between the dorsal cortex of P3 and the hoof wall itself. And this white material, you would think it's a chronic condition, so that is fibrous connective tissue. But what that is actually is a disordered proliferation of keratin from the horny lamina. And without the sensitive lamina to go in and separate them, they just start proliferating all over the place. And this is not something that's ever gonna come back. They never rotate back because they have this keratin that takes up the empty space. Now, one of the things that you will see in P3, you often will see resorption and inflammation in the within the medulla of P3. We have a large resorptive defect here. We have some here. And the correct answer for this is actually D. Medullary inflammation is seen in P3. Uh, changes in P3 are present late. No, they start very early in laminitis. And sclerotic changes are not seen within either the dorsal or the solar cortex. It's a really good article. Dr. Engels knows more than anybody else um, in terms of the pathology of laminitis. It's been a pet project of her for years. And uh, we're going to very, be very lucky in uh, a week that we are gonna get a lecture from her, one of our free Friday lectures from the foundation. Um, and I hope everyone will join us on the 15th of May for that particular lecture. But it's a great article from Veterinary Pathology 2015, Dr. Engels, Osteopathology in the Equine Distal Phalanx Associated with Development and Progression of Laminitis. Okay, slide number five is tissue from a 20-year-old pony. Which of the following is the most likely cause? A, Clostridium novii. B, hypertriglyceridemia. C, aflatoxicosis. Or D, heterobilharzia americana.
Maybe we can make that a little bigger. Oh, that's better. Okay, I want you to get a good look at this picture. Okay, time's up. We're looking at a section of liver, and that's not too difficult, but it doesn't look like a very normal liver. It's got this mottled uh, part, and then it has these dry areas right here and right here. Um, areas that are sort of red have a rim of hemorrhage, but this dry area is very classic for hepatic infarction. You can see a dryness to uh, a tissue that's infarcted uh, by the presence of toxins of clostridia. Um, one of the ways that you pick up muscle is this sort of dry, cooked appearance to it, especially heart muscle with clostridium. Um, the correct answer is A, clostridium novii. Now, you're saying clostridium novii, that is the cause of agent of black disease in cattle. Okay, and yes, it does that during times of migration of large numbers of fasciola hepatica. You can have activation of the spores of clostridium novii, which are pre-positioned in cattle, and you will get infarcts. Um, clostridium novii has been uh, diagnosed quite a number of times in horses. Um, there are a couple of very good papers within the last couple of years describing this one by Dr. Naoki et al. Um, in Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation 2018. Infectious necrotic hepatitis caused by Clostridium novii in a horse. Okay, a more recent article with several, uh, a retrospective study um, that came out of the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory by Dr. Navarro and Dr. Uzal, our friend who believes that every disease in the world is caused by Clostridium. This was published in 2019 in the Gen Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation. It's called Pathobiology and Diagnosis of Clostridial Hepatitis in Animals. It's a very nice retrospective over multiple species of various forms of clostridial hepatitis. Uh, let's look at our foils on this one. B, hypertriglyceridemia. We do see that in ponies quite a bit, and it can cause them to die fairly quickly, especially in times of stress, um, and, but their livers become uh, so full of fat. Um, it's a big, fatty, yellow liver, not looking anything like this particular liver. Uh, C, aflatoxicosis. Well, aflatoxicosis, the gross lesion of aflatoxicosis um, is very similar to pyrolizine alkaloid, and both of those are uh, toxins that if you give it to an animal over a prolonged period of time, you can get a cirrhosis. And so these livers in uh, horses tend to have a lot of, they shrink, they have a lot of fibrous connective tissue. They don't get the knobby look like dogs and cats and people, but they tend to consolidate, shrink. You have a combination of severe biliary hyperplasia and fibrosis, and they may be very yellow because uh, aflatoxic, aflatoxin intoxicated livers may accumulate a lot of fat, the remaining hepatocytes. So sort of small yellowish liver. And finally, heterobilharzia americana um, tends to cause granulomas, mineralized granulomas in the liver. Okay. Our next image from a horse, I would like you to name the most likely cause. Our choices are Flavidon, Flavus, Brunfelsia uniflora, Solanum glaucophyllum, or Ketamaceae fungi. Okay, time's up on this one. We're looking at the base of the aorta. Here are the valves in the heart, and you can see that there is tremendous subendocardial mineralization. Okay, when we talk about horses, one of the more common ways that horses, especially in certain parts of the world, like South America, um, can develop this 
reason of systemic mineralization is due to the ingestion of a number of plants that contain vitamin D analogs. Remember that vitamin D is the gatekeeper and vit activated vitamin D, 125-dihydroxycholecalciphalol uh, in the intestine allows for the absorption of calcium. And if you have too much or you're eating one of these vitamin D analogs in the plants that you're eating, it just allows calcium to come in in just tremendous amounts to the point that it begins to be put down all over the body, starting at the tendons uh, and the muscles, especially the forelimbs. Then it will end up in a number of places, including the kidney, the lung, the intercostal musculature. And one of the last places that you will see is in the vessels and the heart, particularly the uh, ventricles. Um, the three that you should know are uh, of the genus Cestrum, especially Cestrum diurnum, uh, Tricetum, Flavescence, and a number of Solanum, of which Solanum glaucophyllum is the most common. Uh, these other uh, plants all have various toxicities. Um, they've all been published in the last three or four years most of them out of South America, Flavidon Flavus. Uh, I just like the name. It reminds me of the old rapper Flava Flav. Phil used to wear a big uh, clock around his neck for no apparent reason. Uh, and then the others, I don't exactly remember the toxicities, but you can look them up. Uh, you can read more about Solanum glaucophyllum, which used to be Solanum malacoxylon in a 2018 journal article in Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation by Dr. Odrizola et al. called Enzootic Calcinosis in Horses Grazing Solanum Glycophyllum in Argentina. Um, there is another condition that will cause, or several that will cause, uh, enzootic calcinosis. There's a disease, and the last case of this year. 2020 or 2019 2021 this slide conference is a condition known as systemic calcinosis great slide um, caused uh, calcinosis throughout the body it's been identified a number of times and it is a form of metastatic calcification um, you can also see for the sake of completeness uh, calcinosis in the great vessels uh, in animals with hypercalcemia due to squamous cell carcinoma of the stomach and lymphoma, um, two neoplasms that have a perineoplastic condition of high levels of uh, calcium. Okay, the next image, tissue from a horse, which of the following is most likely? We're looking at the, what appears to be the abdomen of this horse. Oh, I gotta read these out, sorry. Uh, A, epitheliotropic T-cell lymphoma. B, diffuse B-cell lymphoma. C, non-epitheliotropic T-cell lymphoma. Or D, T-cell rich B-cell lymphoma. I guess. This is a lymphoma question. So, I don't think I'm giving away too much when I say this animal has lymphoma in the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So, the bottom line is which is the most common. This is a disease that's been around for a long time. It is discussed in Miller et al. from Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation 2015. The Papers called classification and clinical features in 88 cases of equine cutaneous lymphoma. It's a lot of cases. Okay, the correct answer is D. T cell rich B cell lymphoma is the most common of the cutaneous lymphomas in horses. All the rest probably have been identified a handful of times, but it's almost always T cell rich B cell lymphomas. It's often seen in thoroughbreds and it's often seen in females. It's a very interesting uh, neoplasm. When I was a resident, uh, this was known as histiocytic lymphoma because 
um, you have a dense population of T cells. It forms these plaque like growths uh, on the skin. The animal, it doesn't metastasize. Generally, the animal does pretty well, just has these lumps. And when you biopsy them, um, there are lots of small, mature looking T cells and then some big cells. And people initially thought those were uh, histocytes. Remember, when I started in pathology, we didn't have have immunohistochemistry, chemistry. So we made diagnoses based on H and E's and, and special, uh, special stains, but no immuno. Um, but when people started putting immuno on this, they realized pretty quickly those weren't histiocytes. What those are are B cells, and it's a B, T cell rich B cell lymphoma. So often the mo also the most common uh, skin lymphoma in rabbits too, which is sort of a tangential thought. Um, so T cell rich B cell lymphoma in horses. Just remember that one. You will see this. I think we get a case maybe, oh, once a year, something like that. So it's not that uncommon. Oh, the other cool thing about this, and I said female horses. And what happens is these cells have uh, progesterone receptors on them. And so when the animal, animals that become pregnant, these tumors, tend to go away. And then when they deliver, and after they're done, you know, with lactation and all things that result in high levels of progestin, these tumors will come back. So very interesting neoplasm uh, in horses. Okay, next slide is, believe it or not, it's tissue from a horse. The question is, most cases of this disease are caused by, and your choices are, Penniclostridium sordelli, B, Clostridium novii, C, Clostridium perfringens, type A, or D, Clostridium chauvii. Once again, Penniclostridium sordelli, Clostridium novii, Clostridium perfringens type A or Clostridium chauvii. It's tissue from a horse. Okay, well, there's a lot of, of great articles and horses coming out of the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab um, because of Dr. Uzal's interest in Clostridium. So, really sorting this stuff out. There have been two name changes that you should know. First one is Clostridium sordelli, is now Penny Clostridium. Sordelli. The other one is Clostridium difficile, is now Clostridioides difficile. Okay, so, you know, when they changed, when the microbiologists changed all the Chlamydophilus back to Chlamydia to make life a little easier for us, they decided that's not going to work for them, so they had to change names of the Clostridiums. Okay, so we are looking at skeletal muscle, Clostridial infection, um, may be referred to as malignant edema or gas gangrene. Um, the correct answer is C, Clostridium perfringens type A. Um, and this actually is out of a paper called Clostridium sordella associated gas gangrene in eight horses. Um, turns out Clostridium perfringens is the most common isolate uh, in these particular cases. Remember I said that the muscle looks dry well, there's also hemorrhage here, but look how dry this area of the central area of necrosis is. Uh, Penniclostridium sordelli could be a cause of it. All of these could be a cause of it, except for maybe Clostridium chauvii. That is black legging cattle, and I do, am not familiar with any cases in horses. But the other three could be. Um, uh, and so it's just a numbers game. So Clostridium perfringens is the one that, in this particular paper, was the most common isolate. Okay, we got five questions left. I know this is a tough, this is a tough test. Um, boy, if I hadn't read these papers, I would have, I would be struggling a little bit. Okay, so I like this one. This is a great, great picture. Um, and I think this might have originally come from Dr. Kristen Eden from uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech. And we've got multiple sections of, I'm not going to tell you what that is, but you should know, same organ. 
And this is tissue from a rabid horse. Which of the following is correct? A, lesions are more commonly seen in the spinal cord than the brain. B, brain lesions are most severe in the hippocampus. C, spinal lesions are most severe in the cervical thoracic segments of the cord. Or D, equine herpes virus type one and post anesthetic myelopathy are differential diagnoses for this lesion. It's a good question, I like that one. Okay, now the correct answer comes from uh, a paper by Bossino et al. And it was in Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation 2016. And the paper is entitled Characterization of Spinal Cord Lesions in Cattle and Horses with Rabies, the Importance of Correct Sampling. Okay. And uh, this is something that I've known for a number of years. Um, horses are particularly difficult to identify negri bodies and maybe 50% or more of horses um, if you sample the brain, you're going to come up empty with this. The correct answer is lesions are more commonly seen in the spinal cord than the brain. So you've got to get the spinal cord. Look at this lesion right here. Okay, multiple, these are probably multiple sections of spinal cord, but it's a great lesion, for, gross lesion for rabies. I want you to see how the hemorrhage and the necrosis is largely confined to the gray matter. White matter is largely spared. Okay, the way I look at spinal cords, uh, especially in horses, there are certain diseases that preferentially attack the gray matter. One disease that preferentially attacks the white matter and a couple that really don't care. Rabies is one that likes the gray matter. Another one is West Nile virus, really likes the gray matter. Okay, and leaves really much better lesions in the spinal cord than it usually does in the brain. Another thing that you will see that preferentially affects the gray matter is post anesthetic myelopathy. Okay, this is when a horse has been uh, had a colic surgery, it's been on its back for a while, even it might be in lateral recumbency, but probably having something to know. I don't think anyone's really proven how this works, but it's a hemodynamic issue where you get hemorrhage and ischemia of the gray matter of the spinal cord. That's one of the reasons we get these animals up as quickly as we can, or at least we get them into sternal recumbency. So classic lesions. So rabies likes the gray matter. Okay, um, the one disease that likes the white matter, really doesn't care about the gray matter, is equine herpes virus. And so what you're gonna get is, with the HV1, you're gonna get hemorrhage and necrosis out here in the white matter, okay? I don't see that at all, and that takes out uh, our foil D, equine herpes virus, and post-anesthetic myelopathy or differential diagnoses. Post-anesthetic myelopathy, yes. Equine herpes virus, no. The diseases that really don't care and they'll go, you know, white matter, gray matter, uh, obviously would be uh, protozoal myelitis uh, in horses, fibrocartilaginous embolisms, really don't care. Um, Neospora canina, they don't care. So, okay, uh, what other foils have we talked about? Lesions are more commonly seen in the spinal cord than in the brain. Yes, go for the spinal cord. B, brain lesions are the most severe in the hippocampus. Usually carnivores are more severe in the hippocampus. In, uh, in herbivores, I would look in places like the cerebellum, especially in cattle. Well, you can maybe find some in the cerebrum. When I think about brain lesions being in the hippocampus, I'm thinking about carnivores, dogs, cats. And spinal, spinal lesions are most severe in the cervical thoracic segments of the cord. Actually, they're more severe in the lumbosacral segments of the cord, according to this article. So. Great article, just you got it. Rabies is much more spinal cord disease. If you're looking for the lesion. Okay, this next picture is based, uh, or the answer is based on article. The picture's pretty classic though. 
a novel complex tissue disorganization seen in this condition and similar to that in humans is called what? The choices are terminal bronchiolar remodeling, B, peribronchiolar elastosis, C, airway lyomyomatosis, or D, bronchioloadventitial dysplasia. Okay, time's up on this one. We're looking at the lung of a horse. You can see that all of the airways are outlined by an accumulation of mucus, which is likely within the lumen of all of these smaller airways. The condition is known as asthma. Now, it used to be called heaves, because the animals <gasps> would be <gasps> heavy, and you would see because they had to, they had to uh, uh, put so much pressure um, to inhale and exhale, you would see a uh, tremendous hyperplasia of the muscles of the abdomen, and you would have a heave line along the abdomen. You would also see diaphragmatic uh, hypertrophy. Okay, so this is an animal with asthma. There are now a couple of different types of asthma. You have the animals that have pasture asthma, where they're out on the uh, on grass, they're not even. Typical asthma has been thought for many years to be a disease of barn horses. It is a response to a number of different moles like microcephalosporum fani, or some of the other ones. And then um, people start looking at these, and there's actually a pasture asthma with the animals that are out on pasture. And it turns out that the pasture asthma animals um, are a much better model for human asthma. Than the, than the ones that are in the barn. This has been brought out in a paper written in Vet Path in 2016 by Ferrari et al. And the name of the paper and the answer to the question is horses with pasture asthma have airway remodeling that is characteristic of human asthma. And as we look at our answers, um, one of the characteristics of human asthma in chronic cases is terminal bronchiolar remodeling. There's a lot of fibrosis in there, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a finding that uh, in the humans are very familiar with in terms of that these horses have as well. I made all the rest of them up. Peribronchiolar elastosis. That sounds good. Airway lyomyomatosis. You know, we see smooth muscle hyperplasia in a lot of different diseases um, in the lung. So I thought, I like that one. Bronchioloadventitial dysplasia. I just made that up. Um, okay. That was a good one. Tissue from a horse. Name an associated condition. Your choices are A, concussive trauma to the occipital bone, B, high levels of phosphorus in the feed, C, cervical stenotic myelopathy, and D, brachynathia maxillaris. Okay, time's up. Hopefully everybody recognized where you are and you are looking at one of the cervical vertebra. And here's the facet of the cervical vertebra. It looks concave. It looks cracked. There appears to be a fracture and a partial removal of this large piece of the articular cartilage. This is a condition of osteo chondritis dissecans. The entire lesion here would fall under the category of osteochondrosis. Osteochondrosis lesions have been associated with thoroughbreds with cervical stenotic myelopathy, a disease that comes in two different flavors depending on 
the age of your thoroughbred. The younger thoroughbreds, it is called a uh, stenotic myelopathy. They are moving, you pull their head down, so they have subluxation of the vertebra and they start to stumble, become ataxic. Um, static stenotic myelopathy happens a little further back, C5 through C7 in older animals, four years of age or more. Um, and it is a, a constant uh, subluxation. There is hyperplasia of the ligamentum flavum and pressure on the uh, ventral aspect, the ventral funiculi, the spinal cord causing damage. Um, but, but one of the lesions that you see in, in these two diseases is uh, facet lesions often having, you know, often having something to do with osteochondrosis. There's a tremendous amount of work out there, fantastic work on osteochondrosis, especially like the work by Dr. Kathy Carlson um, up at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, she does a great job explaining this. I tend to oversimplify things. And I believe osteochondrosis lesions, which are associated with overnutrition, growing these animals, and this is why we see it in thoroughbreds, because we really push them, we want to get them out on the racetrack, we put them in a high plane of nutrition. And what happens is they tend to build muscle a lot more than they build bone. Um, it's a, a faster process to build muscle. And when you have too much muscle on the skeleton frame, you get weight bearing at different angles than you're supposed to in the naturally developing animal. And it causes occlusion, uh, pressure on an occlusion of uh, blood vessels within the developing synovial cartilage, and you end up having lesions within the cartilage, lesions in the underlying bone. These are osteochondrosis lesions. And then it becomes sort of this vicious cycle where it contributes to some of these other conditions. So great OCD lesion, cervical facet, seen in animals with stenotic myelopathy. Okay. Slide number 12 out of 13 is tissue from a horse. Additional lesions may be seen in which of the following organs? A, liver. B, lung. C, pancreas. Or D, pituitary gland. Okay, time's up on this one. We are looking at the cerebrum of a horse, and you can see a very discrete area of hemorrhage and necrosis outlining the white matter of the brain. So this would be a lesion that has been referred to as leukoencephalomalacia, or moldy corn poisoning. It arises from toxicity with one of a number of toxins, uh, usually a few monocin is the one that is identified. Uh, and this is the product of Fusarium verticelloides, which will grow on moldy corn or other grains. Okay, this is a classic lesion, but you can also see necrosis in the liver as well. These few monocins uh, tend to be associated with liver necrosis. We did mention aflatoxin earlier. Um, B, lung, let's look at that foil for just a sec. Um, toxins that cause uh, damage to the lungs. Well, one of those that is very closely related to all these is pyrolizidine alkaloids, and that tends to cause uh, hypertension, venous proliferation in the lungs, or at least vascular proliferation, especially on the surface of the lung. Pancreas and pituitary gland are just sort of threw in there. Um, but leukoencephalomalacia, if you look at the horses, they also will have damaged livers, perhaps uh, cirrhosis if they've been eating it for a long time, not at a level that causes 
the sphingosine and sphingonine accumulation in the endothelial cells of the brain and the vascular lesions that result in this white matter necrosis. Okay, last slide. Hope you were paying attention earlier because I pretty much gave you this answer. There's an incidental finding in an adult horse. Name the likely cause. A, Parascaris aquorum. B, Salmonella typhisuis. C, Heterobilharzia americana. Or D, Clostridium piliforme. Okay, time's up. Now, there's some very important information. Whenever somebody on one of these tests tells you it's a foal or it's an adult horse or whatever, they're trying to push you down one path. Okay, a couple of these diseases are diseases of young horses, of foals. Parascaris aquorum. We talked about the fact that there is a migration through the liver and the lungs. And you may see eosinophilic hepatitis, uh, and the animals may have a little bit of respiratory trouble in the summertime as these larvae migrate through the tissues before they come back to the duodenum to finish their life cycle. Um, but I told you it's an adult horse. This is not a foal, so we're not going to worry about that. Uh, the other one that you usually see in foals is Clostridium piliforme. That is diffuse necrosis, and it's often massive necrosis. These animals become hyperinfected. Um, usually they're exposed to Clostridium piliforme from the mother species. The mother's sort of getting pushed on the nutrition, and she gets a little extra concentrate, and it causes a disruption of bacterial flora. So you get more clostridium piliformi than normal. Remember the foals get a lot of their uh, bacterial flora of their gut, which is established by eating mom's poop. Um, so they get a good dose of clostridium piliformi. That's why we see it primarily in foals and it's diffuse necrosis. The liver looks sort of yellow, not yellow because it's fatty, but yellow because it's just necrotic. Salmonella typhosuis, um, not even what I would consider in, uh, in horses. Uh, they get salmonella typhimurium, and it, they're not host adaptive. That it would usually be severe enteritis. So we're left with hetero Bilharzia americana, and this is a great paper that came out of uh, Texas A&M University uh, a number of years ago. This condition was first identified by Klaus Bergeld in Florida. I believe almost 20 years ago or longer than that. Okay, what we're looking at is we're looking at the diaphragmatic surface of the liver and you see all these little round white nodules and these are all mineralized granulomas from heterobilharzia americana. The adults are living in the mesenteric vessels. They are blood flukes. They lay their eggs. Their eggs get into the portal circulation and they end up in the liver. They get stuck around the portal area and so they get into the portal areas of the uh, into the portal triads that's where fluke eggs generally get caught up and then they set up shop but uh, over time they will die they will mineralize like we see with fluke eggs in so many different species and that is the the, uh, the origin of these small mineralized granulomas. Supposedly when you look at them uh, with a radiograph, it looks like a very starry sky appearance with all these little bitty areas of, uh, um, of mineralization. Uh, the original author on that paper, as I recall, was Dr. Wayne Karapi. Um, it is now and has been in Jevon Kennedy for a number of years, or a number of editions. Uh, it's in volume one, pages 315 through 316. And these granulomas tend to be in larger numbers on the diaphragmatic surface for some reason of the liver. Okay, well, I bet you all did well on that. Uh, hopefully, you've got some new articles to go look up. All great lesions, great articles, and, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, this second half of our multiple choice uh, gross pathology of the horse test. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with a little more diverse 
uh, test as usual. I look forward to that. I hope all of you have a great day.